Vi presento adesso Marlene Stricker che è la fondatrice di Digital City, una virtual community ad Amsterdam che è già stata presentata ad Ars Lettonica nel 1995 e quindi una delle prime community a livello almeno europeo. Una delle sue funzioni è anche quella di fondatrice di Valag Society che è un laboratorio multimediale, no profit, interdisciplinare di ricerca e sviluppo in vari campi che lavora quindi in una prospettiva di tecnologia verso la società ma anche in un'attenzione di collaborazione tra persone di crescere la capacità di esprimere e anche in una prospettiva che non è solo quella digitale ma è quella del Fab Lab e quindi anche di un laboratorio di modellazione in qualche modo. L'attenzione quindi è quella proprio che vi presenterà in questa conferenza, un concetto di open design come apertura di scambio, di interazione tra la progettazione e le diverse forme di progettazione. Uh, un altro suo ruolo è quello di presidente di Picnic, che è uno degli eventi importanti delle imprese creative a livello europeo, che anche qui funziona come media festival e come community. E io direi adesso di lasciare la parola e apriremo poi magari ad alcune domande, a un dibattito nella parte conclusiva. Thank you very much. Uh, I almost understood it without translation, <laughs> getting, getting better in Italian. Um, is the presentation working? Yes, um, I was asked to talk about the public domain and then I, I started to think about this whole last 20 years of how we uh, entered and, and, and conquered the internet. And then I realized that it's not just uh, 4.0, but we, I will also talk a little bit about the public domain 5.0, but that will be at the end. Um, I saw this very nice quote uh, in one of the books from the Share Festival from Mark Tripe, which actually says that art practice is, is um, not specifically born to, to specific technology, but it's actually experimenting with all technologies and trying to make sense out of these technologies. And I feel much um, uh, um, part of this movement of artists that are taking technology in their own hands and trying to shape it according to our, their own ideas and concepts. Um, so let's go back 20 years when uh, the public domain 2.0 started. Because um, public domain 1.0, you would say, is our normal environment. And only when we started to realize that cyberspace was an actual space or a, pl a place to be, uh, we started to think about the public domain 2.0. And it was a time that it was um, a sort of a feeling of go west young men. It was uh, the cowboy mentality. There was a space that we wanted to conquer. The, the names were cyberspace or the electronic highway. Um, but I'll show you how it was looked like in the internet in 1993. It looked like this. <laughs> Anybody has good memories of the internet? <laughs> So this, this would be the sound for those who were not there 20 years ago. And this would be the, the prompt that was sort of looking, waiting for you to, to take action. And um, that would prove you would need to understand Unix or any other pro, uh, pro, uh, language to, to make something happen on the internet. Um, so we realized that this would not be an interface for normal people. Uh, this was first, the first five years or 20 years maybe of the internet, when it started to perceive it was uh, a scientific environment, a military scientific environment. Uh, uh, but in 1993 people started to open it up for a sp first a small elite and then in January 19, uh, 15th of January 1994, it, uh, we uh, started with the digital city. And we found a, a, a metaphor that was uh, enabling people to enter this space. 
and to, and to, to uh, understand what the capacity of the internet could be for them. And we deliberately chose the, 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 the metaphor of city because it both includes public spaces and private spaces, places that you could shape uh, uh, places that s small allies, uh, but also big squares, official buildings, uh, official organizations, and individual activity. Um, we choose that metaphor to, 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 to have a rich metaphor, which would sort of help a lot of people to understand the capacities and the possibilities of the internet. So this was, st but still, this was for a lot of people very difficult. And this was pre-web. So in 1994, um, uh, we started with the digital city as a visual interface. And maybe this would be more familiar to you. This was a, a whole a very, very advanced interface with uh, squares, thematic squares, and in the middle you would have places where people could build their own home. So you would click on the on there, and there you would have your own home page or your own website. Um, it would also know who would be online. It's, it's sort of like a, a, a social media. It, actually, some people st said that social media started only a few years ago with Facebook and so on. But I would uh, uh, argue that the internet started as a social space. It was social media from the beginning, from the, from the early public beginning. And only later it got monetized. So these are some of the interfaces for the squares that you could uh, put your, your information on. So I think Digital City uh, in itself attracted uh, hundreds and thousands of people and it was um, a, a one big experiment, uh, an experiment in, in cross-media, transmedia. We did exper experiments with uh, live chat, with television. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think we did all the things that still are now uh, uh, possible in this very, very early days. Uh, webcams, remote controlled webcams, all that kind of stuff. So I still think it has been a very rich exploration uh, in a combination of hackers, artists, and, and uh, activists, people that don't take the world for what it is, but try to shape it according to their own ideas and, 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 and uh, concepts. Um, but what, where are we now? And um, I think for, for me, the Web 3.0 started with um, the whole concept that we are the cursor. So we're not waiting for um, this prompt, this Unix prompt that asks us to make a, a, a comment or to put some writing in. Now we as a person are the ones that are moving the system. Uh, for me, I, I can show that with a project that we were doing in 2002, which was Amsterdam Real Time. This was the first time that people were uh, collectively, there were hundreds of people being asked to participate. And these were normal Amsterdam people. We would give them uh, a device, a GPS device, and uh, what then was called a personal uh, PDA, a, a digital as assistant. Now, of course, they are all integrated in the, in the phones that we have. At that time, there were still separated uh, technologies. And people would be invited to make their own, uh, to use the city and their data, their, their use would be real time being uh, presented in a, in a conference, in a, in a real big screen, and it would also be captured. So, um, and step by step, the, the city was sort of emerging from the way that people use the city. And I think this has been the first, I don't know, maybe in the world, but it has definitely been one of the first that this whole concept of people generating data real time uh, was uh, was practiced. Again, in a collaboration with, uh, uh, with artist uh, Esther Polak and uh, Tom de Meijer from the Waag and some other people from the Waag. And actually, these are, I'm not sure if it's visible, it's always very difficult, the black on white. Uh, but this one is a pigeon. <laughs> A pigeon from two miles uh, square meters. So it's, somebody started to see a pigeon in the map of Amsterdam and started to draw the map, the, the, the pigeon. And well, it's almost in, impossible to show you. I can show you later when you you can check on real time uh, Amsterdam real time on the web. The, the whole project is documented uh, in on on the internet. So that would be the the, the, the public domain as being uh, being seen from. Uh, people that sort of started to find technologies to, to make this new space uh, for them accessible. But of course we are now in a new, there are a lot of different things happened at the same time. So this whole concept of um, 
sort of a sort of an interreality where we are getting technology in our public in our physical space. So we, if the, if one dot o is the real space, the 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 the, the, the concrete space. Uh, 2.0 is cyberspace, then 3.0 is the combination of both, cyberspace entering our physical world. Um, and now I think we could talk about a big data landscape. Just as an example, again, this is the central station of Amsterdam, and now we are aware of all these different uh, maps. So this would be a map, this is a way to represent the place, this is a way to represent the space. And um, on the, on the, on this, what, what's now happening with big data, open data, and all the different data uh, uh, monetizing projects is that everything that we have is being put into data sets and are being either published or being uh, stored in, in, in big data uh, uh, warehouses. Uh, we've been involved in a project called uh, City SDK where we work with open data. Uh, it's a project in Europe where uh, some cities collaborate, uh, Amsterdam and uh, uh, Rome and Manchester and some other uh, uh, places. And this is a visualization, again, not so very uh, uh, good to see here. It's a visualization where we looked in, the, in how old cities are. And you can see it from the color coding of the buildings. Um, you can check it online, it's, uh, it's uh, citysdk.wark.org and on slash um, uh, buildings. And this would be another representation, real-time information, this is the city globe. And this is something that, um, it's actually, if you, uh, I can't show you real-time here, but you can do it on your own uh, devices. You can access the whole globe on real-time data. And you will see the, 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 the traffic move from place to place, real time. And you can enter to, you can look at uh, Amsterdam, or you can look at Istanbul, you can go into all the different systems. And this is only what we are providing, but it's also the big companies are doing this. Um, there's a the lot of big data initiatives coming from McKinsey's and other big companies. They're trying to capture as much as, uh, as data as possible to make analyses and to make some reports and to try to figure out uh, how to, how to uh, get, make policy. Um, so the, the real question now is, where is the private? Is this, the whole concept of public is now so all-inclusive. Uh, um, we know that everything that we do is being, uh, so there's surveillance on everything that we do. I mean, Snowden, NSA, I think we finally got a, got a picture. It's even worse than our nightmares. Uh, everything that we do is being seen. And. So it, it, this whole endeavor of opening up these technologies and, and entering cyberspace and, and making nice projects, is it still this idealist environment? Are we uh, maybe helping something else to, to immerse, emerge what we don't really like? Is, 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 if, if some people feel a bit betrayed by the internet at this moment, point in time. Uh, and um, so how did it, I think one of the main reasons why it started and helped us so much is that this is the this is the picture of the architecture of the internet back in 1964, and they had to decide on what kind of architecture they would choose, and they could have chosen for a computer network which would be centralized, but is very vulnerable to for an attack, and they could have chosen for a decentralized network which is also still very vulnerable, so they chose for a distributed network, an architecture that every node can connect other nodes without a center. And anyway, this is, opened up, this is the box of Pandora. It opened up so many possibilities for us as citizens and organizations. Um, and I think it also explains this peer-to-peer -peer networking that we now see. Um, we don't have to work with institutions. We can, you can, you can group and work together with other uh, nodes in a network. Uh, there, there are a lot of sort of like hierarchical systems that are under threat because of this peer-to-peer -peer networking. Uh, if it's, it can be uh, uh, um, governments, but also companies and also the larger knowledge institutions. So you see so many different uh, uh, um, things that are happening on this level, and these are just some of the examples. 
Um, and I think of in each of these lemmas and in each of these concepts, you would have conferences every day in all over the world. So this is this is some emerging new practice. And I still believe in this. I'm, I'm, if I say that I feel betrayed by the internet, it's, it's a double message. I think both things are happening. This kind of stuff is happening, the open hardware, the open technology, the peer-to-peer -peer networking. And it, it does create new power infrastructures. It does create new possibilities for individual people and it helps people to organize themselves differently. But again, it's very nice, but we also are in a monetized public space. Um, every step we make, uh, every move, every content that we put online is, is part of a, uh, an incorporate internet. And we know about all the social media is being monetized, and we are the, it's free, but we are the content, so we're paying with our own lives, actually. It's, um, it doesn't really feel very nice. So, I think we have to start really to discuss the technology itself and stop only talking about content and about uh, uh, the nice possibilities of internet. We have to move into another area, another level. And this shows you that the technology is not good or bad. It's not in itself intrinsically good or bad, as long as we know it's not neutral. So, you can, with the same internet, you can make an open, distributed internet, but you also can make a, 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 a centralized internet. So, the cloud and all the kind of concepts about these kind of technologies are all there at the same time. And I showed you a lot of examples of the, 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 the ones with the open, distributed. But the same model is being used for very centralized social media con concepts like Facebook. So, in a way, we are lost in this interreality. This is just one way to show a very complex uh, 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 ecosystem that is part where uh, all these different levels are working together. And it's very difficult to figure out uh, where you are uh, and what are, your what are the constraints, what are the technologies that actually are shaping our interactions. Um, so, again, I think it's time for a new step into this, uh, con this whole discussion about the public domain. And this is the Smart uh, Citizen Manifesto that's being uh, written by Frank Krizin, my colleague at the Waag. Because um, there's a lot of rhetorics about smart cities, and I, I will show you some of that uh, uh, in a minute. Um, but they are all def defined as smartness coming from centralized systems. So smart cities are basically models to to impose on citizens, impose on cities, and then the, everything will be okay. We will have sustainable cities, we will have efficient cities, we will have secure cities, as long as we put technology in every device, in every element in our cities, even in our trees, and the whole internet of everything model is being pushed by both policy making and pushed by industry. And funny enough, it's also being pushed by individual people because we all love technology. So, so we also love the gadgets and we, we, we feel attached to them. And we all think it's very nice to have a plant that talks to us. Uh, and we also love um, this kind of idea that, that the refrigerator will order their milk. I mean, we, we all love that kind of concepts. But I think that the real st step that we have to make is this step. If you can't open it, you don't own it. If we don't understand the technologies that surround us, we, have, we, we, are don't, we are not owning our own environments, and therefore we can't be responsible. I think that's the basic step. Uh, people don't feel responsible that when they don't feel a, a, a sense of ownership. Uh, this is the, the, the adaptation of the, the, the maker's movement, and I think you will you refer to the Fab Lab. You see this, of course, in all different uh, places. This whole maker's movement is a step in, in this sort of trying to figure out again how our environment works and to get a maker's perspective on it. Um, a feeling like that we can, if we, if we open everything, 
we finally maybe understand what's inside and then we can also repair it and we can take and we can make stuff with it. So this would be the car and I will show you a project which took it to the extreme. It's an artist who wanted to, to make a toaster. He, he, he saw these toasters in the, in the shop and they were so, so very, they were so cheap. So he said so like, how can it be so cheap? Am I able to make a toaster on my own from scratch? So the first step that he made was trying to figure out what's in the toaster. So he found all these elements, and a lot of them are minerals. So he thought, can I make each of these elements myself also by getting to the, to the places where I can get the minerals? So this was his prototype, which is sort of almost there. And this was his final product. Uh, still, so in, in the end he realized he was not able to make one on his own. Uh, and this is when he's in the, in the, in the shop uh, costing 2,000 or 3,000 euros. So he was not really, so his mission was impossible. But I think we found some ways to do this kind of things and to, 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 to get out of this consumer position. And one of the key elements is open design. It's really about sharing and, and, and sharing the, the, the solutions and sharing your knowledge. Also, on open, and we know we have Creative Commons on, on content and we have uh, sharing uh, a lot of source code, open source, uh, and open hardware is in the whole movement. But open design is a key element in this idea of ownership and trying to, to get ownership around our, on, our, on our lives. Uh, we published this book, uh, Open Design, a few years ago. It's now being translated to Japanese, which is really nice. Um, and it tries to explore this whole space of open design and what it can be. And we now also have started um, an open design minor uh, uh, a course that we give to the, um, an art school in the, in the Netherlands. And I hope it becomes part of the curriculum in schools, in design schools and art schools. So the concept of open design is that you share your solutions and that you also are um, uh, sharing your blu the blueprints of the documents and of, and of your designs so that it can be downloaded and printed locally. And we, we do some projects for, for prosthesis. But um, you see some in different social environments, you see that it really works, that people start to share solutions and, con and concepts. But I will show you this project, the Fairphone. Because we, we have done some research in, in, in uh, the, the how a phone is being made. Because we, you, you will, will be all aware that there are conflict minerals in these iPhones. In each, each and every phone you have in your pockets. Each of these phones are made in bad working conditions. Uh, we don't really know who made our phones. They're, they're sort of anonymous people that are worked for us. Uh, there is uh, minerals in conflict zones, coltan, gold, uh, tin, those, those kind of uh, minerals are in there. And um, we studied this for two or three years uh, with the WAG to look into the whole production chain of phones. And we realized that, uh, and we talked with everybody in the whole production chain, and nobody could or wanted to move, or was able to move. Not the Motorola's, not the Nokia's, not the Apple's, doesn't want to move. Uh, none, of the, none of the people in the supply chain was able to make a difference. And of course we have fair chocolate and we have fair um, uh, coffee, so why not a fair phone? So after six months ago, we realized, well, it's a little bit longer ago, let's say a year ago, we realized that the only way to get a fair phone was actually to start starting to make one. So we took the very brave step in, in thinking like we can make a phone. And, and this is because a lot of the knowledge is being shared. There's also uh, is already a geek phone, and people in, of geek phone were, uh, were willing to work with us. So in, in, the, in, in the whole world there are people working on open hardware, open software, open, open source uh, operating systems like Ubuntu and Firefox. So we can tap into all this knowledge of a lot of different people that already made parts of the whole uh, uh, chain. There were people working in, uh, for fair mining, uh, for tin and gold. So in the end we started to have the fair phone and we um, financed it from the Waag with our social venture. So we have social capital to put into this kind of spin-offs from our research. And uh, so that kick-started it and then we asked consumers if they want to participate. 
and uh, for, within 10 days we had 5,000 people that pre-ordered the phone. And because they also not only pre-ordered but also paid for the phone, we could be in the, we stayed independent from banks and venture capital. And now only a few days ago we sold all 25,000 of the first batch, and they will be delivered in in December. And that we can make this phone is, is really uh, remarkable. It's, it's such a complex uh, device, which would normally be, uh, it would be impossible for a few people uh, which never made a phone. I mean, it's, it's, these are, the Fairphone is being made by a company that only exists for, ha uh, for a year, with people who never made a phone before. Uh, so, so I think that kind of interventions are, are really, really very interesting. Um, so for the, for the fair phone, we can say there are fair wages. It's a fairer phone, I have to say, because for really fair phones, you would need world peace, which is not there. So we, it's, we see fair phone as a movement, as, as, a, as a movement towards even fair, more fairness in the whole production chain. But it's also based on open principles, open design principles, and open hardware principles. And one of the one of the, the big uh, steps we we have to make in the next generations of the Fairphone is uh, also can we make it Prism and NSA proof, uh, which would mean that you have um, control about on the hardware, on the on the chips, and uh, there are it's an, on, on an operating system on the phone because most of the of Android and other operating systems have backdoors for NSA. Most of the, the hardware that we have in all our technologies have backdoors to the NSA. So how can we make a telephone which has no backdoors? Uh, it's, it's a very big challenge and we, we only when you step step by step you come you come closer to what is needed and on each of these projects there are people so Ubuntu is there it's an operating system uh, that I think has no backdoor to NSA and you can install it on the on the on the on the iPhone without jailbreaking um, there are people working on the basement chip uh, basement chip is a, a, the, a second operating system running on our phones which ha use radio frequency and they definitely are not they're, they're, they definitely have uh, 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 backdoors so but there is a group of people working on this so again working and collaborating on this distributed manner it can help us to come closer to this kind of fair technologies and here you have uh, also the cost breakdown one of the things that you have to do is also, also to be open and transparent about who pays what and gets what in the whole production so this concept is uh, this is part of the whole idea of being transparent and and, and being open about the whole thing so the, the whole the whole the project of fair phone inspired uh, the um, uh, a person who was working on the smart meters and it's, it started to help to start a project called fair meter um, maybe you're aware that, that the european commission and the european parliament agreed that all european households will have a smart meter before 2020 so it's been that will be 250 million fair meters well sorry not fair meters smart meters in our homes and this is the argument the saying that if you measure uh, if people have uh, 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 information about the, the way they use their energy they will use less energy and it will be very good for 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 sustainable cities um, the problem is that they want us to share this data with companies that we don't know who they are. They are the, most of the energy companies have very unclear um, ownership structures and shareholder structures. They're all shareholders driven. So why should we trust our data, our, our data of our private homes with companies that we don't know? So we have to, we, and we, I think we now, we, we, because we know that everything is being used, and everything is being monetized, and everything is being uh, combined with other data, um, I think people started to understand that, they, that they, it's not so much do you have something to hide, because a lot of people start to say, well, what do you have to hide? But maybe just the concept is wrong, to share your data with other companies that you don't know. And uh, so, let's stop that. Why, and why should your, uh, uh, the European Commission and uh, also our national parliaments uh, decide that we as an individual need smart meters? 
without really thinking about the whole data protection and the whole structure of it. So, yes, I think fair, fair could be sustainable, but we, we, we should sort of quit this whole concept of sharing this data with unknown people and companies. But we do want to share it with people that we trust. So how to, can we again uh, define and, and make it an opt-in for ourselves to choose about how we want to share the data? And this is only the smart meter. I'm just, I'm, this is just one, one little, little thing of the smart city uh, rhetorics and all the things that are happening now under this umbrella of smart cities. This is only the energy consumption thing. But there, there are many, many other technologies that are imposed in our societies at the moment, in our cities, and we are not discussing it. And my biggest problem is that politics are not discussing it. So they're imposing structures that, that really influence our social structures, and they do discuss law, but they don't discuss technology. And I think politicians should understand algorithms, and urban planners should understand algorithms. Um, so yes, we should go into new, new roles and to find systems that are reciprocity driven and based on at reciprocity and are transparent. And uh, this, this really needs a new dialogue about technologies in our daily life. So we started the Fair Meter Initiative together with the Aliander. So we joined the energy infrastructure company to figure out how can we make a fair meter. Fair in the sense of sustainable, like the fair phone, but also fair in the sense how they deal with the data. What is the data model behind this whole structure? So this must be familiar to you. We opened up the smart meter, which was even very difficult because they asked us to, to sign an, uh, a non-disclosure, which is quite funny because they put these devices in our homes and we're not, and, and we actually pay for them. They're not a gift. They're, we pay for these, these uh, uh, machines or these uh, uh, meters. We are not allowed to open it. So there is a very strange story here. And we find out that this, um, these, are, these are the only real elements that are important for measurement of, of energy. And we said, well, why should you not make, we can make it our own. If we can make, uh, we have Arduino, our open hardware. If we can make a fair form, we can make our own fair meter. So why should we uh, take fair me, uh, smart meters from, from companies that we don't trust? Uh, and why should we live this kind of lives where data is being put in stored? This kind, this kind of the messages and the, the, the architecture for, for smart metering. So again, you can quit the whole stuff. We can do it ourselves. We can share it with people that we trust. And you would have an empty space instead of a lot of companies in, this, in the middle. Um, here you have another example of how we can make our own measurement systems. Uh, this is the Smart Citizen Kit. It's an initiative from uh, Thomas Diaz from FabLab Barcelona, working together with uh, the people from San Francisco. And it's, it's based on, uh, on an Arduino open hardware board. Uh, and it's, it's, it's measuring um, um, humidity, CO2. This, these are systems that citizens would like to have because people want to understand understand their environment, but these kind of technologies are uh, understandable, open and transparent. And um, it shows that look, we do now project with 100 people in Amsterdam that get this kind of smart citizen kits. We have workshops running with them and in a way it's also sort of interesting because now citizens can talk back to, 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 their, to their systems that the, 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 the government has. So for me, the, the whole question about public domain 4.0, it's, it's this question. Um, it's, it's not about the interreality as such, because we are already living that life. We already are immersed. The, 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 the cyberspace and, and our physical space are already interrelated. And we don't even know. It's already in our minds. We, we know how we, the, the time and space already collapsed or merged. But if you, if you talk about 4.0, I think it's really about this algorithm, the if-then structure. It's the code. And we have to understand the interpretation and the code, because if we don't, the algorithm will define our relationships. And, um, and we know, I mean, most people know about uh, the, the, the algorithms that are in the search engines. So the way that, because we all use Google, and Google has an algorithm that sort of defines 
how to interpret it, the immense amount of data. And it tells us what is, has, will be uh, prioritized and what will be first. So this is a very generic story that they gave about their algorithm, but it's clear that it's all based on monetizing the information. So if we have this concept of the internet as a, an access to all knowledge, to all people, uh, and we all use Google, it means that we have access to all data and all information that can be monetized by Google. So that's our window on the world at the moment. And there are, at the moment there are no alternatives for Google. There are some that try, and you try it, uh, and, but it's not, this has no real uh, 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 enough eyeballs at the moment. So if Google can, uh, we have to understand the algorithm. Google won't open up their algorithms. They won't tell you how they make their interpretation of the data that's available. So this is big, a very big challenge, a very big challenge, because I think this, the, a lot of people are being sold to the internet as access for all people to all the information. And we're ending up with having access to the information that can be monetized. There's really, really a very small window on, 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 on humanity. Uh, but when I was working on this project, and normally I would end here, and this is already a big challenge. I mean, this is a challenge that, you, that, that we all are, have to, to, to step into. And it has to be te taught at school. I mean, schools, my problem is design schools and urban planning schools and school, uh, uh, most of the academia are not aware of this kind of stuff. They think engineering is something for engineers. And they don't see engineering and technology and information technology as something for, for how about humanity. It is actually about what is what, what are we as humans, and we have to understand this also in the humanities in other areas. And it should also be taught at art schools, I would say. But mostly you don't see any technology in art schools, real technology in art schools. So, but I, I, I come across another big challenge, and um, it's like the question about public domain 5.0. I would consider it's a little bit of a game with the, with the. It could also be public domain, new technologies, or next generation, or uh, whatever, or mobile, whatever. Um, but this would be the real question about um, who owns your body. So it's clear that bio biotechnology is the new space that is. It's already there for a long time. It's a new public space. It's, uh, we can know about our DNA, we can know about our cells, we can know about our bacteria. Actually, we know about DNA print, uh, uh, telling you who you are, and, uh, but uh, it appears to be that the bacteria even tell us more about not only who you are, but also with whom did you encounter. So this, there's a whole field that sort of defines us, and it's becoming data very rapidly. So we have to figure out that, uh, who owns our our, our own personal space, uh, really the flesh, the, the bacteria, who owns it? And do, what, do, you, do you know about yourself? Or does somebody else know more about you than you did? Um, so, and again, you see that, that this combination of artists, hackers, and activists are, are already working in this field. It's um, a group uh, like um, Critical Art Ensemble is working on this field for the last 10, 20, 20 years already. Um, but it's very rapidly expanding to a whole do-it-yourself biotech uh, movement. And all these people are working on, on the same con concepts and principles uh, as we already discussed in open design, about op open and transparent information and knowledge in understanding ourselves and trying to, to f balance this whole concept of private and public. So um, I would uh, want to end with this big quest we don't have to understand the algorithm, we also have to understand life. Thank you very much. Scusate. Eh, mi sembra molto completa proprio nella sua storicità di come il concetto di dominio va a estendersi. Eh, una, una prima attenzione che mi viene in mente è eh, quando parliamo di dominio pubblico 3-4, cioè questa serie di servizi condivisi per la città, le piattaforme che fanno riferimento a, a file 
phone ma ha una serie di servizi che possono servire da GPS per l'energia, per, per diverse funzioni di conoscenze di servizio alla città a cui fanno riferimento questi servizi, Amsterdam per esempio ne ha tantissime, adesso nella prospettiva Smart City coordini questa visione. I very much believe in, 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 in collaborations between citizens, individuals, small companies and, and the governments. So I think the open data movement shows that there are very good models for that. And um, I, I would say that, that they, they, they start to understand that open government means that you have to create platforms that a lot of people can enter and collaborate. So yes, the government should provide data and should provide the systems partly, but they should also um, uh, see that a lot of the, the intelligence is not in their own system. It's outside of their system. It's outside of government. Um, so it, it's, it's building an ecosystem between the different players. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you also have known about the hackathons and the, and the, the boot camps. And, and there, partly there are um, a new phenomena uh, which are uh, sometimes they're a bit, little bit hyped or a bit fashionable. But at the same time, I think hackathons and co-creation and, and design labs are there to stay. Um, governments are now being made for this decision making. And all the process and interactions are based on decision making. Um, it will be very interesting to see if you can make a government based on design thinking. If, if you start to think about design, it's much more an inclusive process than decision making. But this is only a very early beginning. That we, in, in Amsterdam, we have uh, we work together with the, um, a new course for civil servants. It's called the Nieuwe Wiebaut. And we are one of the ten groups that work together with, we have now seven uh, civil servants that want to learn how to work differently. So they, they try to implement that in their own uh, uh, working uh, environments, but it's, it's still only the early beginnings. Un altro termine che è sicuramente di grande interesse, è come il, il dominio pubblico possa influenzare lo spazio fisico della città, eh, come forme, come segni, il modo in cui il mondo diciamo, digitale entra in relazione con la città reale. Cioè, quale può essere una forma di segnale, una forma di attenzione? Che aiuti anche a, a chi non è più di tanto dentro la tecnologia digitale a, ad avere facilità di accesso, a avere eh, più facilità di entrare in contatto con i, con i servizi del dominio pubblico. I'm totally sure if I understand it, but it's about the interaction between the, the physical and the... Uh, Sorry, I don't il modo in cui il cittadino può essere stimolato a entrare nella nuova dimensione di rapporto dell'intera realtà eh, perché pensiamo da cosa nasce il discorso da una città, da una realtà urbana in cui questa logica del, del dominio pubblico ha un accesso ancora quantitativamente limitato chiaro 
Well, again, it's a very strange thing because 20 years ago, uh, many people said that internet would be only for the rich or for the very elite, and that uh, old people would not use the internet and women wouldn't use the internet. So, it would, and then now it appears that women are the, using the internet more because it's a communication uh, uh, technology, and that elderly are also using the internet. So, it's it's not that the the, the old digital divide. Uh, is still there. I think we, uh, and it's very immersive, so a lot of the technology is already there without you knowing it. It's already part of the system. I think um, the, the biggest problem is that when you are now, when you are uh, rich and elite, you can escape the internet. And only the poor have to stay in the internet because the, the way they will get their money uh, will be based on uh, computer interaction. They, 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 are, they, are part, they will be in the database. So I think the problem is, is changed. Uh, I think normal citizens are already captured in the smart city and they don't know how to get out. So again, I would say we have to learn and, and help people to understand how they're part of this system. And um, the way that we do it, I mean, we, we started uh, uh, um, something called the Fab School. And Fab School is uh, the whole concept that you start, it, it, it's a, a, a learning environment for young people, but also for their parents, because we realize some of these parents don't know either how it works. And um, so these are open sessions and uh, for people to, to enter and to come and collaborate. And I think it should be taught at school. I think, I think the whole technology savviness of, of citizens have, have to rise because uh, on, on all levels, uh, because we are living in a highly technical environment. So I'm, I'm, I'm at the station of I'm not so, f so much afraid for people not to be in. I'm, I'm more afraid for people not to get out. L'approccio importante è quindi anche quello accennava adesso dei Fab Lab, cioè del imparare e crescere no? su questo tema della città. Eh, questo, questa iper, hypercraft, questo ritorno diciamo, al, all'artigianato, al, che è anche condivisione di prossimità molto importante, eh, può essere definito oggi come un approccio politico o è una semplicemente una strategia per, per la Smart City? I think the Fab Labs and the, the, the maker spaces are um, not, not, they're not there because of policy making, they're really because of people take the initiative and collaborate together. Uh, it is, in my view, uh, uh, an example how people start to try to, to get ownership again and to, and, and, they were, and to find a way to be responsible citizens again, to step out of the consumer paradigm and, and to start to... Because to, to, we know, of course, the internet has been seen as a space with user-generated content that we produce ourselves. But our physical environment was still, we couldn't touch it. We don't know how this is being made. We don't know how this is being made. So these are all mysteries, or they are mystified. They are they're deliberately, I think, mystified. They tell you it's very difficult, very complicated. You have to be very, very smart to make this kind of stuff. And now we suddenly try to figure out, well, it's not that, that difficult. So it's also a movement of demystifying technology and demystifying the whole world of industrialization. I think it's, 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 it's if you look at our uh, last century, we, we put everything in the, in the factories. So people started to work in factories because it was too complicated. The machine was too complicated. Now the machine got distributed. So we have a personal computer and we have personal fabrication. So m most of the, what the machines can do in the very um, uh, high-tech environments, we can now do in our own homes. We show with the, the do-it-yourself bio uh, lab 
but we also ha we have a very small but very well equipped biotech lab. So we can do a lot of things that normally people would think that you can also only do in very sophisticated labs. So it also shows that it, that this can this is both demystifying but also making it again locally produced and. This, in this whole story, there's, there's one very interesting story about the pencil. I'm not sure if you know about the, pen, the pencil. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a story about a pencil that tells about how it's being made. And um, Friedman, our, the, the big guy from our, the, the, the free markets, he is, is on YouTube. It's a very interesting small video where he explains the pencil and he says, look at this beautiful, simple pencil. I don't have it, but you can think about it. And um, you can buy it only for a few cents. Because many, many people over the whole world all contributed a little part of it. And we don't know who these people are. But it's the invisible hand of the market, and that's why it's only a few cents. And I think this is, this is, the, this is the narrative that, that our whole economy is based on. So we don't know who these people are. You don't have to know who these people are. For you, as a consumer, you have something that's very cheap. But people want to know who made this pencil. We don't want to have anonymous people somewhere in the supply chain that had to suffer because we are have a, we want to be cheap consumers. And you see this in, in clothing and in, in all our products. So I think uh, this whole concept of the makers movement and fab labs and, and this opening up the, 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 the demystification of the production process and technology is also about rethinking economy, uh, rethinking the whole narrative of global economy. And trying to figure out to make to, to feel some to base economy on values and real values and not shareholders driven values. So I think the story is even bigger, but that would be a story about a peer to peer economy and and uh, and and this the pyramid model and and all the mystifications that are in our financial system at the moment. Un'ultima domanda, se quindi eh, il tema del, <coughs> del dominio pubblico, eh, dell'interazione digitale apre una nuova economia e questo sicuramente è un problema essenziale per la città europea, no? una rigenerazione urbana con una nuova economia, eh, in questa prospettiva quale può essere un, un, un ruolo futuro anche in relazione alla governance, alla pianificazione della città? Cioè eh, il sistema di mapping, il sistema di eh, comunicazione aperta dei dati può servire anche a... Eh, pianificare, prevedere, condividere le proposte di servizi per la città, ad esempio, a livello del quartiere, a livello locale. C'è cioè, da qualche vostra esperienza in questo senso? One of the things that I, I like a lot at the moment are the open spending projects. And uh, open spending is, is, is publicizing in an open and raw data format your, the, the budgets. Of, um, so there are some experiments now in Amsterdam, that, in different places that it's, it's happening. But in Amsterdam it started with the central um, part of the city that opened up their data. And now others are following. So maybe in a few, maybe in a year, we will have real open spending in, in Amsterdam, which helps people on a local level to understand budgets and to see how deci decisions, but also how priorities, prioritizing things ha are happening. Um, I know that I mean by by entering that 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 concept of open spending and how asking people to to help to define how to use the budget our tax money also it will also bring us in new problematic areas of course I mean we know that we that we we we, we use politics to to help us to make difficult decisions um, but again and again, this this whole um, movement of local uh, people taking locally uh, their their responsibilities is also that they also find new ways to solve these issues. So um, it it definitely requires new concepts for politics as well. And. Um, 
if you look now in, in, in nation states, I mean, we, we, we already regions know that they have to work with other regions and they don't, ha they don't uh, apply so much to, uh, they don't trust national governments anymore. And maybe that will also happen in cities, that people start to collaborate between nodes in the cities and don't trust their national, their, their, their local government so much. So this whole concept of distributed nodes that collaborating, the, the picture I showed with people making connections outside of hierarchical systems, uh, I, I guess it will occur more than we know now. Uh, volevo ancora chiedere se c'è appunto qualche domanda da Luca e da, dal pubblico. C'è qualche domanda dal pubblico? I'm the only one? Ok. I got a question for you. Um, the, the point uh, I will ask you is uh, how much uh, trust can we give to the information collectively uh, collected? Sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I make you an example just to. Some, some years ago, during a multimedia show, I connected to, uh, to a, a, a network like this, a network of objects, to the uh, Geiger sensor of Fukushima, reading the uh, radioactivity level in real time, and showing them during a, a spectacle. The point is that everybody trusts that it was real, and I think it was real, but I'm not sure. And I'm speaking about uh, really dangerous data. So uh, one of the point is uh, collectively data information is not, not necessarily uh, true. Maybe it's manipulated. So we need something to, to be careful about. And the second point is uh, where is the limit? Because there are some kind of information which is really safety critical. And uh, I'm really worried about uh, this point of view. So I, if everybody tell, uh, tell to the city or openly that where is the uh, CO level or in their place or how much uh, they are consuming, it's okay. But if they start to, to tell me where are the trains, or where are the, it's dangerous. Because not, every, not everybody is a, a good guy. So these two points uh, about uh, how, how we can deal with the risk of the manipulation of data, uh, how can we deal with the risk of misuse of uh, collectively collected data? I don't think so only in terms of economical... Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the problem is that data, you can lie with data a lot, especially with visualizations, uh, because you have to, to make a decision, is it red or blue? Or is it big or small? I mean, so, so that's why I say that the, it's the, the if-then, the algorithm inside is the instruction that what you do with the data. It's essential that it's open. It's because if it's not open, you can check how the data has been interpreted. So I would say that every system that tells us stories about how to interpret the data should be open and transparent which means that most of the economic um, 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 uh, models should be open. So not only the data should be open, but also the models should be open. And I, I, I refer to it as the open algorithm, which is, is, is one of the stuff that is really uh, yeah, essential in this whole story. Um, but everything open, it, it's... It's, it's really, it's, it's about, uh, of course, there are very good reasons why, sh why data should, should not be open. There are very good reasons for that. There is certain stuff that we don't want to be open. So, um, there, there are also some reasons why governments or companies don't want to open everything that they have. But there's a big, big difference in open by default. And then for certain sets of data, you have a, a good argument why it should stay closed. Then close data, and you have to argument how to make it open. So I think this is this is really the the the, the, the Copernican the, 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 the Copernican move that we have to make is it should be open by default, and and it should be because um, we live all by the concept of uh, the idea that we have a contract social with our governments. 
I think it's a real, it's a big lie, one of those lies. But anyway, but we like we like that story, we like that narrative. So we, the citizen, uh, we the citizens, we have we have problems in in ruling ourselves. So we we elect some people and we give them the power to do stuff for us. So as if we employ them, and we also pay for them. It's our tax money. So so this is the story that we tell each other. And of course, this is not how it's, historically, this is not the way how it went. We had kings and we had all kinds of powers and structures. So in a way, this whole model of our democracy is, of course, partly a lie, partly not, but partly a lie. But still, if you, if you think about the contract social, if you, if, you, if you take this narrative serious, then this data is ours. So what, what's now being said to us by the Snowden, NSA, all these stories, and also is that our governments don't trust us. So th th they, from their point of view, um, stopped this contract social. They said, we don't trust you. We are something else. We are something different. We are, we are from another dimension than, than you. So I think this is this is very fundamental. I think it's, it, we only are aware of it. I mean, t ten years ago we were working with Conrad Becker from Public Netbase, and he was organizing these huge World Information.org exhibitions. And they were great. A lot of the technical media artists were part of it, and this was this big conspiracy about Echelon. And people would visit this big World Information.org uh, uh, exhibitions. They were like, "Huh, conspiracy." But I mean, we, I, I talked to him uh, a few weeks ago, and we realized that this, his conspiracy was really small compared to what really is happening. I mean, we couldn't even imagine. It's beyond our imagination. So I, I would love to have a conspiracy science, because I think conspiracies are, are true and very interesting, because they mostly are really pointing to something that has a very real existence. Um, so I, I feel that, 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 that we are in a big crisis, and, and many people feel that with me, and I, I really feel that we have to regroup and rethink. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit astonished that it doesn't have more outcry, especially with people that are based in politics themselves. It's, it, it amazes me that, that they're not totally uh, out of their minds of what's happening. But it also tells me the story that every, at the moment that you're elected, you're in another dimension. So they're not working for us. That's very clear now.